since Major League Baseball is in the midst of this lockout for today's Throwback Thursday edition, what I decided to do is go back in time and compare where the Mets were the last time there was a lockout in 94-95 to where they are now in 2022. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans who are watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Ficklestein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing about the Mets at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. All right, so I want to take you back in time to 1994 for a throwback Thursday because I think the one thing that you can, I don't know, take some solace in is that the state of the league is not in as bad of shape as it was back then, in my opinion. And also the state of the Mets is certainly a lot better and we're going to start right there because back in 1994, the Mets were in the thick of a rebuild. You know, they had all those great years in the 1980s from 1984 through 1990. They had seven straight winning seasons. You can really make the argument that was the best era of baseball in the entire 60-year history of the New York Mets. Four of those seasons were 90-win campaigns. Two of them, 100-win seasons with the high watermark, of course, of 1986 where they won the World Series and also won a franchise record 108 games. You look at what happened after 1990, and this franchise went on a clear downslide. They won 77 games in 1991, 72 in 1992, and then they really cratered in 1993 as they did not even win 60 games. They lost 103 games. So you headed into that 1994 season with a labor dispute going on with the players and the owners. And I just wonder, and I couldn't have been there. I was born in 95, but I wonder what it was like to be a Mets fan during that era. And I'm sure there's some of you watching this or listening to this uh, who do remember 1994, 1995. And I encourage you to reach out to me at Finkelstein Ryan or reach out, uh, you know, to our Twitter account at Locked on Mets and tell me about some of those stories of what it was like to be a Mets fan during that time, because it was clearly bleak. I mean, the 1994 season was the first without Doc Gooden in the Mets starting rotation. And along with him, Howard Johnson left as well. So the last vestiges of the 1986 Mets were gone at that point. And you're talking about a team that featured players like Todd Hundley, uh, who had 16 home runs in 91 games. Jeff Kent, who we talked about uh, in a recent episode of Locked On Mets, where I was breaking down uh, some of the worst trades in franchise history and trading Jeff Kent was one of those deals. And in that season, he had 43 extra base hits in 107 games. Then you had Bobby Bonilla. And I think we always focus so much about the contract with Bobby Bonilla. What happened after 1999 where the Mets, you know, to get him to buy out of that contract, agree to the 35 years or however long it ends up being until 2035 uh, to pay him that, that million plus dollars each year that he gets by Bonilla Day a staple in this franchise's history. I wonder if that's going to happen before or after we get games this year. I certainly hope that we get games before that because I feel like by Bonilla Day is like July 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Regardless, though, if you talk about his first tenure with the Mets because Bonilla was with the Mets in the mid-90s, left, and came back. In 1994, I mean, arguably the best player on the team hit 290. 374 on base percentage, a 504 slugging percentage, 24 doubles, 20 home runs. He was good in the 95 season as well, which we'll talk about in the next segment uh, before the Mets ended up dealing him. But that's an interesting team with some players that maybe had you uh, at least starting to think about a, a new promising future. You had a starting rotation with some interesting names, one of them being Brett Saberhagen in the middle of his career. We pitched to a 274 ERA in 24 starts. You also had Bobby Jones pitched to a 315 ERA in 24 starts. Bobby Jones, one of those underrated Mets who had a nice career with them. Uh, and also just an interesting storyline, a name I really have never heard of, 
but just picked him up going through baseball reference, looking at the 1994 Mets. Have any of you heard or remember uh, Jason Jacome um, or Jacome? <laughs> uh, this is a pitcher who was a rookie in 94. Prior to the lockout, he makes eight starts, pitches to a 267 ERA. And I just wonder if there was this Jacome train that was heading into a, a player strike. And on the other side of it, people might have thought that this kid was going to be something. And he never really amounted to much as he was pretty bad the following season, ends up getting uh, let go. But uh, just an interesting team to look back at some of the names. One of the things that I found fascinating is that John Franco saved 30 games for a team that won 55 games altogether. So clearly a lot of close ball games that the Mets are able to squeak out and get wins. They were better in the second half than the first half. They were 15 and 11 in the second half prior to the strike and eventual lockout of the sport. Um, and really, though, if you look at where baseball was at that time, Kind of fascinating to think about the 94 season because that was also the first year that they realigned divisions. So previously, you had uh, the NL East, which consisted of the Mets, the Phillies, the Expos, the Cardinals, the Cubs, the Pirates, and then the Marlins were added in 1993 as an expansion team. 1994, the introduction of the Central Division, which boots the Cubs, the Cardinals, and the Pirates from the East. And also does something which was so detrimental to the future success of this franchise. The Atlanta Braves uh, end up going from the NL West to the NL East. Now, in their first season in the NL East, the Braves did not win the division because obviously no one won the division. But they were in second place to the Montreal Expos, the team that is uh, most um, associated with the strike and the cancellation of the 94 season because they were... I mean, an unbelievable force that year. They went 74 and 40, had an outfield of Marquise Grissom, Larry Walker, and Moises Alou, which was you know, arguably the best in baseball. They were just dominant. Pedro Martinez in the early stages of his career, just a really dynamic team that never uh, reached those heights again. The Braves were six games back when the league got shut down. And then you look at what happened from 95 on. And we've talked about this a lot on this show uh, when we go through the Mets history and the history of this franchise since the Braves entered the division. After the strike, when the league resumed in 1995, the Braves won the division 11 consecutive seasons from there. And I think if you do the math, I didn't have that in the notes for today's show, um, but it's something along the lines of the uh, Braves. or I think the Phillies and the Mets have each won the division. The Phillies and the Nats, I think, have each won the division five times. The Mets have won it. Oh, man, I have to now think off the top of my head. You have, what, 06 um, in 2015, and I think that might be it um, since the Braves came in. It's something along those lines where uh, the other teams in the division have won like 12 of the potential years, and the Braves just win the division year after year after year. So that is one of the interesting wrinkles of what was happening in 94, 95 as the Braves were getting introduced into your lives as Mets fans. Me being uh, a Mets fan born in 95, I've never known anything but the Braves in the Mets division, but that has certainly changed the course of history for the Mets as that is a team that's just dominated the NL East. Now, what ends up happening is you have this player strike that was in the works throughout the entire 94 season. Suddenly, and we'll, and we'll talk about some of the, the details about that in a minute. You get a strike, and there's all this data as to what's going to happen. And it's a very similar parallel to where we are now. But I do think that if we really dive into the conditions of the league back then to where they are right now, I think you can maybe be a little bit more optimistic that uh, the future of the league is in better hands. And this hopefully will not be as a lengthy of a stalemate as we saw previously. But we'll discuss that more in just a minute. Football might be over for this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props, to where the next fire coach is going to land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online where the game starts. 
So if we go back to the strike in 1994, one of the first major things that led to the strike is the owners decided to withhold $7.8 million that they were required to pay per a previous agreement into the players' pensions and benefit plan. Then suddenly uh, courts got involved and ultimately on July 28th, the Players Association's executive board said an August 12th date as they strike date if a deal did not come together, um, the players went ahead with that threat to walk off the job. And the last games of the baseball season were played on August 11th. On August 31st that year, three and a half hours of negotiations with federal mediators produced no progress. No further talks were scheduled. The strike went into a fourth week. Then Bud Selig, the then commissioner, uh, set a September 9th deadline. We, we've heard this before, right? Arbitrary deadlines that are set. Um, to resume play or cancel the season. And interestingly enough, the MOBPA offers a counterproposal to ownership uh, on September 8th, calling for a 2% tax on the 16 franchises with the highest payrolls to be divided among the other 12 clubs. The teams in both leagues would share 25% of all gate uh, receipts under the MLBPA's plans. The owner's response was to claim that the measures would not meet the cost to resume the season. And on September 14th, a year before I was born uh, to the day, Bud Sealing uh, acknowledged that the strike created a irreparable hole in the game's fabric and the season was canceled, which ultimately meant the loss of over $500 million, uh, according to uh, reports back then when it came to ownership revenue and $230 million in player salaries. Back then, your average player's salary was $1.2 million, so significant losses for both sides. And that brings us to where we are now, right? It's once again um, the players who are pushing, like they were back then, for more competition and more compensation. Those are the two things. Owners, traditionally, are always trying to protect their own bottom line. And that's where you get into these stalemates. And last time it took, I mean, a U.S. District Court judge to ultimately resolve that lockout, that strike. On March 28th, 1995, the players voted to return to work. Uh, or, or, yeah, so the player, the LBPA had a vote that they would return to work if a U.S. District Court judge supported the National Labor Relations Board's unfair label practice complaint against the owners, which was filed on March 27th. The vote came in at 27 to 3. The owners uh, had supported the use of replacement players, but the strike was ended when and the judge, Sonia Sotomayor of the United States District Court, uh, issued an injunction against the owners on March 31st. And on April 2nd, 1995, a day before the season was scheduled to start originally with replacement players, the strike came to an end after 230 days. Now, you look at where we're at right now, and you compare it to then, and luckily, at least, the counter lines up where last season wasn't impacted by this, right? We all saw this coming. We saw a lockout as a really imminent possibility, but that season was able to play out normally. And now, while you are cutting into the 2022 season, there is still some hope that you're going to get a majority of your games played. That year in 1995, the season was ultimately postponed three weeks and teams played an abbreviated 144-game season. Could we see something similar right now if we're already the first week into um, some postponements? Give them a couple more weeks. If these sides at least continue to talk and you can get 144 games, then I think a lot of us would be really happy with that. Um, but it just comes down to the owners you know, staying at the table. And, and you know, they present this as their last and final offer. Hopefully that can change because the players – are going to be pretty resolute in this. They want a better deal than that best and final offer. Um, so hopefully something can come together here. And hopefully it doesn't get to a point as well where you need these district courts to get involved. And in the past, it was basically courts telling the league that what they were doing was unjust to their players. And it all is about money. So again, you look at what happened last time, all that lost revenue because they weren't able to, to play a, a postseason, which is where the league makes the most money in their schedule. I don't think they want that to happen again. I also don't think they want to lose out on, you know, other 
nationally televised events like the All-Star Game. So hopefully all of that will uh, push a deal to happen sooner rather than later. And then we can get a season maybe like we got in 1995. And interestingly enough, the Mets were not good. <laughs> uh, they went 25 and 44 in the first half that year. Did finish strong going 44 and 31 in the second half. Some of the big stories of that season, Bobby Bonilla, as I said, was a monster. Hit 325, 385 on base, 599 slugging, 47 extra base hits in 80 games. I uh, gotta wonder if Bobby had a little bit of help back then. Uh, it was, in fact, the steroid era. I don't know. Those are just some some crazy numbers. Uh, was traded midseason. He did return, as I said previously, in 1999, which ultimately led to that infamous contract. Uh, you also, in 1995, had the debut of some rookie by the name of Edgardo Alfonso, certainly a player to watch. He had 278 that year. His best days were ahead of him when it came to the power department, but he uh, showed himself to be a solid player and was a fixture of the Mets lineup from that point on. You also had the debut of some of Generation K, Jason Isringhausen and Bill Pulsifer, both in the rotation uh, did not end up being fruitful careers for those Mets. I talked about them in the biggest uh, draft bust in Mets history, although Isringhausen was more of an honorable mention as part of Generation K, a late round pick that could not be considered a draft bust, especially when you consider uh, you know, his successful career with the Cardinals as a closer. But uh, yeah, just the Generation K was in full effect that season. And also, as I already mentioned, Jason Jacomi, fell off a cliff. Again, any of you uh, remember Jacomi, I'd love to hear any stories or thoughts you have on him. Uh, lastly, a note I have from the 1995 Mets, Jerry Depoto was part of the Mets bullpen last year. Um, and Depoto would go on uh, later to completely fleece the Mets in the trade that has landed Robinson Cano still on the books for a couple more seasons, as well as Edwin Diaz, the Mets current closer in their bullpen. So things have a way of coming full circle. Regardless, if you look at where the Mets were then and think about where they are now, this franchise is in much better shape. And I want to discuss that a bit more in just a minute. But first, I want to tell you about the best part of my diet that has helped me continue to eat right as I wanted to do this year as part of my New Year's resolutions. And that is having Built Bars because Built Bars are a snack that I can go to that's healthy, delicious. They replace any candy bar fixes I ever want. If I'm ever thinking about chocolate, I just go in and grab a built bar because all of them come covered and are hundred percent real chocolate. If I don't want uh, the bigger snack of the built bar, I'll pull out a built bar puff, which is the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy. They're marshmallowy. There's incredible flavors like the cinnamon churro. That is just delightful. All built bars and all puffs again, come covered in that hundred percent real chocolate, making it the perfect way to avoid other sweets. If you want to try Built Bar today, go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCK15. You're going to get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. So why endure the often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter will just look up on their computer the brand that their warehouse carries, and they might not get you the best deal when instead you can go to rockout.com, shop from all the different manufacturers, and potentially save 30%, 50%, maybe even 100% more for the exact same parts that you would get at a chain store or a new car dealership. Rockout.com is a family business that has been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for every customer. So go to rockout.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck and right locked on in there. How'd you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliable low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. All right, so I want to just uh, go back in time one, once more here and compare where the Mets were as a franchise back then to where they are now. The Mets went 71 and 91 in 1996. This is the year after the strike. Then they finally started to hit a level of success beginning in 1997 when they won 88 games. A big part of that was the addition of John Olerud, who was a huge, huge part of the Mets during that era. Then in 1998, another huge addition in Mike Piazza. 
from 1997 to 2001. The Mets had five winning seasons. Then they went through another three-year downturn before getting a little window of success from 2005 through 2008, which, of course, was the David Wright era that followed the Mike Piazza era. Of course, you know, other great players on those teams like Carlos Beltran and Jose Reyes with David Wright, Carlos Delgado. Um, and the Mets just could not ultimately come together and have the type of postseason success that they would have liked. But the thing that kind of jumps out to me is any time in Mets history, if we're talking about pre-strike and post-1980s, you had that that window between the 80s Mets and the early 2000 Mets where there was that big downturn where they had to rebuild. Then you had, after the Mike Piazza era Mets, that – you know, again, period of a rebuild before you got to the David Wright era of the Mets. And then even during David Wright's era, there was that big, you know, stretch where they really struggled early on after the Bernie Madoff scandal and the Wilpons being at the forefront of everyone's minds. Sandy Alderson is able to build a winner in 2015 and 2016, but that is short lived. You have another period, which we're still sort of in right now, where this franchise is trying to gain their footing. I think the 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 one thing you can look at now compared to those years of the past is the Mets, instead of being the little brother in New York, are suddenly exhibiting the behavior of, you know, big brother. They are going out, they are spending. Right now, one thing I probably didn't talk about enough yesterday when I was focused on the lockout is just how much Steve Cohen, I feel like, is weighing on these negotiations when it comes to the new CBA because I really think the other owners are scared of his spending power. I think that this was a decision that the league did not take lightly to let Steve Cohen into their exclusive club. And I'm sure there's some owners that regret that after seeing the way he was able to just make some monster splashes like the Max Scherzer signing right before this lockout. That's significant. And so I think there's other owners that are scared of the Mets right now. And I think that's partially why there is such a focus on those uh, CBT thresholds, the, the the tax, they want to make sure that a team like the Mets will be penalized significantly for having a $300 million payroll. But if you're a fan right now, which you have to take solace in, is that not only are the Mets willing to pay tax penalties and to shell out for a very expensive roster, but even in the time right now where the league's in a shutdown, I look at the minor leagues. I think, well, the Mets have prospects right now that are getting the best training that money can buy, that are getting the most information possible through all of the technology that is being you know, poured into the lower levels of the Mets minor league system all the way through. There's so much more data out there. There's so many coaches being brought in, so many different instructors. And I just feel like the Mets are going to be in a point a couple of years from now where they're going to really be able to develop ton of players and so with that with the resources that steve Cohen will continue to pour into the franchise when it comes to major league payroll as well i think we're heading towards an era of mets baseball where you know knock on wood here they should be able to have success without those periods of downturn and the last time that we saw um you know a lockout and if we go back to 94 and compare it to now this franchise is in just a, a much better position than they were then, which obviously makes us more anxious for the return of baseball. But uh, maybe it, it will help you as we get through these months of inaction to know that what is ahead on the other side of this lockout and in this new CBA where we hopefully will have labor peace for the next five years is a lot of really fun Mets baseball. Um, so that's something to at least uh, look forward to. Another thing to look forward to is tomorrow's edition of Locked On Mets, where we will be focusing on the future of this team. We've been going through the top 20 prospects in the Mets system. Now we are at the top five, where I'll be joined by Jordan Grossman as we go through the top part of our list. So make sure you tune into that. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show. At Locked On Mets, thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On MLB, hosted by Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call him Sully. He'll bring you his unique perspective on the major leagues past and present. 
It's free and available wherever you get podcasts.